there are very few truly brilliant people whose hearts are just as big as their brains. Phil Nottingham is one of those people. You can count on just about any of Phil's friends and total strangers to have an inspiring story about how Phil has generously helped them in big and meaningful ways. He does this quietly and without any expected return, but these stories are truly echoed all around the world. I have heard Phil stories uh, that, you know, he's helped people in Bali, all over the UK, and over in Prague. So talk about building a global brand without a global budget. Phil has done that 10 times over. Uh, so please join me in welcoming the one, the only video and brand marketing strategist, Phil Nottingham. At every conference I go to, the story is always the same. The funnel is broken. This idea that we can market to uh, to people, to consumers or businesses by trying to drive them through a linear journey, which ends up in purchase, just doesn't really work anymore. Because things like GDPR means that all tracking is double opt-in and we can't you know, necessarily keep hold of all people and measure exactly what their interactions are. With dark social, a lot of conversations are happening on places like WhatsApp and Messenger where we can't see the conversations that consumers are having with one another. And the dominance of Facebook and Google controlling ever more of the digital ecosystem means that you know, unless we're paying money to Google and Facebook, we often can't reach our particular customers to communicate with them themselves. So this idea of the funnel is increasingly causing us a lot of problems. And the answer to this is often cited that we need to market for preference rather than conversion. So in a world where we can't think about driving people through a conversion funnel, we need to start to build up that reputation that makes consumers want to go to us directly. In other words, we need to build a brand. And every conference is now, you know what, the way to really future-proof your marketing, the way to really stand out for the long term is to build a brand. But I've always sat there, and I'm sure many of you have, and thought, okay, how? How do I, as somebody working uh, for a, maybe a small or a medium business without the resources of the Nikes and the Adidas's and the people who can do these huge, great big uh, Super Bowl ad type campaigns, how can I actually build a brand in a similar way? And it's a hard question, but I'm here today because I think I've worked it out and I want to share the answer with you. Um, for the last few years, I've been working with a company called Wistia and we're a video uh, hosting uh, company in the sort of software B2B space. And um, I've also worked with a bunch of other companies to sort of help them work out how to use their marketing to better build a brand. And I'm going to show you some of my findings. So first of all, what have we been doing wrong? And I think the way in which we currently try to build a brand is causing the problems. So what we currently do is as follows. We'll start by trying to uh, make sure that we create a great customer experience. So we will invest in amazing support, sales, make a beautiful, easy to use website, and hope that this helps us stand out. And this is great, but the problem is that a good website is now a commodity that everybody can have, and good sales and good support teams are sort of table stakes for just competing these days, rather than a way of really making yourself stand out. So you really can't differentiate with customer experience. Okay, well, when we've done that, most of us then say we've built this really great website, we've done all our kind of core technical SEO, we've really got to the stage where we can now start to build our reputation, our brand. So then we start to go towards things like blogging. We'll start to write loads and loads of posts, we'll start to create more and more content, um, hiring writers and doing all that kind of stuff. And again, this can work and it can be really helpful, but it's increasingly less effective. With 600 million blogs out there, it's very, very hard to stand out. And also, uh, walls of text don't necessarily help you convey personality particularly well. One of the key ingredients of brand is, of course, personality. Um, it may help you as a writer stand out as an individual to explain your thinking, but it doesn't necessarily help you as a brand craft your identity. So next we think about maybe we need to start doing PR. That's the way we're going to really help build a brand and stand out through that. So we will probably engage an agency and we'll do big campaigns and we'll try and come up with a a, a social change or we'll try and tag ourselves onto an existing happening in the world and try and make our story front and center through the conversations can, uh, consumers are having. 
But again, the problem with this is that it can work, but it's extremely high risk and very unreliable. The majority of PR campaigns do not lead to an amazing uh, way of building a brand. That happens very, very rarely. So to treat this as a strategy, to your strategy being we are going to be the 0.01% that do it, is not necessarily a very reliable or effective one. Uh, so then what we tend to do once we've maybe done a bit of PR is then think, well, let's try and build up our reputation on social media. Social media is obviously where a lot of conversations are happening. It's where brands can be built. It's where we can start to converse with people. So we will create short, uh, snackable videos usually, do some images, do fun things that help us be part of the conversation on social media. Um, and this, uh, again, can work slightly, but has some problems because social media doesn't necessarily uh, help you build a brand. And just because something does very well on social media doesn't necessarily mean that it's helping you uh, drive that essential preference and, uh, and consumer and relation with your particular brand. If we think about the way social media is measured, often it's with these three categories. We have things like applause, uh, which basically means the number of people clicking like or, or favoriting a tweet. Uh, we have conversation, the number of people commenting or replying to a post, and then amplification, the number of people sharing it themselves. And we'll often measure this uh, in aggregated metrics that are then used uh, relatively. So we'll try and measure over time our like rate and our comments and our shares as amplification rate, applause rate, conversation rate. Um, and we'll download these kind of reports often from uh, you know, social media measurement tools, and we'll then try and track this over time and see if we're doing any better. But of course, the problem is that we'll end up working with a media agency and getting a report that says something quite impressive, like, you know, we did this campaign and we saw a 35% increase in brand amplification. Sounds great. The problem is what this actually often means in reality is that this campaign just had a few more shares than it did last year. And so these relative measurements uh, trying to be constantly relevant on social media is not necessarily uh, helping us and it's not necessarily a good benchmark in any meaningful sense of our, of our brand. Uh, additionally, actually going viral on social media doesn't necessarily help people on the brand at all. This was a video that um, we launched at Wistia a couple of years ago and this particular video uh, did really, really well. It got like 100,000 shares and you know, lots and lots of people were, were liking it and it was a sort of video about this Snapchat hot dog filter so it was kind of relevant and speaking to the community and the audience about the things that they cared about. Uh, did it do anything for our traffic or our brand search or our otherwise reputation? No. The performance was only visible on Facebook and Twitter where it did well and uh, everywhere else it just didn't seem to translate into any meaningful value. Uh, and this is the sad truth, social media marketing can be valuable but it's not necessarily a great or primary avenue for brand building. And going viral does not necessarily help uh, build a brand. So once we've done some social media, so we've got all these covered, what we'll then try and do is, of course, invest in the big kahuna in some advertising. And we'll try and you know, invest in great creative that pushes out our message to tell key stories. Um, but again, there's major problems with treating digital advertising as the main way in which you're going to build a brand. Um, you know, if we think about the way in which things work, this is what a view of a video looks like on YouTube. Here it comes and it's gone. And we are spending a fortune buying loads and loads of these and hoping that this will help stand out. Or hoping that maybe, again, we are that 001% that create an ad that people actually stop and watch, that they actually stop and really engage with. But they're basing a strategy on being the 0.01% is uh, it's not great odds. On Facebook, again, we get the same. Here's a view on Facebook. Here comes the ad and it's gone. Facebook's primarily mobile. People are just watching on their phones. They're scrolling through. The average view is not more than a few seconds long. So we're trying to build a brand basically through lots of these, through lots of just uh, 200 response codes, just a browser loaded a video and it played it and that was that. And of course, this is not necessarily that good or effective. If we think of what a brand is, a brand is the way a, com a company, organization or individual is perceived by those who experience it. And if you are just perceiving a few seconds of something over and over again, if you are just perceiving a brief interaction over and over, over again, these quick touch points, lots and lots of subliminal messaging, it's not really going to work. This idea that we can build a brand through the impressions on an ad is a very outdated one. It comes from uh, the 60s when this was you know, possibly likely that just because people were not seeing ads all the time, the fact that you were standing out um, on Madison Avenue with your billboards meant that a few more people might be able to 
uh, relate to your business more than others. But in a world where we're just bombarded with ads all the time, simply having digital advertising does not make you stand out or help you make you build a brand. No one has proved this. There's no evidence. It's just anecdotes and occasional instances where we are relying on an old, an old and outdated model of doing things because we don't feel like we have any alternatives. And the problem is that the number of impressions is not the number of people impressed. We seem to be stuck in this Romeo and Juliet narrative where uh, we imagine that the consumers there on the, uh, on the balcony saying, oh, brand, oh, brand, wherefore art thou brand? And we're just sat there as uh, brands just say, yes, pick me, pick me, pick me. Um, we're trying to build love uh, at first sight all the time with advertising. Of course, this just doesn't work. So digital advertising itself can be a very useful marketing tactic, which we'll get onto, but it doesn't necessarily help make people like you. It doesn't necessarily help in and of itself with building a brand. It can do. There's many counterexamples, but they are the few, not the many. The many, it's just wasted spend. And in fact, you can see this if you go in to have a look at your um, particular analytics on Facebook or, or YouTube, you'll see that if you really drill down into the data, Facebook are kind of lying to you. Your headline metrics will be something like this. You'll see that the performance of a post that you did, a promoted post, huge numbers of minutes views, lots and lots of views, um, you know, all this good stuff. And then when you actually drill into it, you'll see that the vast majority of those views are just dropping off in seconds. So it's just super, super quick and it's gone. Um, yeah, because people are scrolling through, they're not watching the whole thing. But Facebook have kind of set their limits such that you know, a three second view is really uh, you know, not very much. And a 10 second view is actually anything that's sort of between the three and the 10 and we're just gonna slightly hedge it. So it looks more valuable than it is. If you strip out all of these numbers that are just people who are clearly just scrolling um, past on their phone, you'll see that in reality, you have far fewer views and a uh, much less time watch. So you need to be very skeptical of these metrics. We're asking the same people that we're giving the money to to, to tell us how well it's performing. So we're stuck in this kind of 50 billion collective delusion where we'll say, you know, you know let's uh, give Google and Facebook money. Uh, they're then gonna distribute our content for us. We'll then ask them what they got for the money. They tell us that it did so, so well, and loads and loads of people watched it, but we should also spend a bit more money. And then we believe them. And we're just caught in this lovely cycle of, uh, of doom where we just give all this money to these huge corporations and don't actually necessarily get any value back. Um, and there's two concepts with brand building. Um, and we seem to be overly focused on the first, which is brand awareness. So the two concepts are brand awareness and brand affinity. So first of all, they know you. And secondly, they like you. And our, our current outdated model seems to be predicated on the idea of if we can just get people to know us, if we can get people to, to see enough of us, then they'll also start to like us. Um, but actually, in the modern world, I think we don't have to take this approach at all. We can cut out this notion of brand awareness. We can stop worrying about this idea of trying to get people to see us all the time and just go straight for the thing that we really care about, brand affinity. And this requires a new approach to content marketing. So received wisdom has always been that shorter videos are better for marketing. You know, people have short attention spans. If you can get everything into a very short period of time, it's going to uh, provide more value and you'll have fewer people dropping off. But I'm not so sure if that's true anymore. Um, here is a video that we made for Wistia in 2017. We decided, um, per the explanation that I gave earlier, we had got to that stage where we were doing well on social media and we just decided, actually here, what we need to do is to invest in some advertising to grow our brand. You know, the metrics are kind of flattened out. We knew that we needed to do something. So we injected loads of money into a big ad campaign trying to compete with the big players. And we spent about two million on different ads, bunch of TVs and billboards, and you know, digital stuff, of course, Facebook and YouTube, lots of it. And we got about 43 million impressions on this particular campaign, which was around putting faces on different everyday items and trying to kind of be about expressing your company more personally through video to advertise our video hosting software. And uh, it completely failed and it just did nothing for the overall kind of results that we got from this. The traffic was, we got a bit more traffic from the campaign. And that bit more traffic was about as much as if we posted a new particularly good blog post. So we spent two million bucks on really what could have just been a better blog post. Kind of sucked. And so we were chatting with um, Adam Lisagor about this, who is the, uh, the founder of a company called Sandwich Video based down in LA. This was back in, um, in 2017. So we're saying, you know, this kind of didn't work. You've made loads and loads of really good ads for uh, particularly software companies. 
is there a way we could partner up and maybe explore doing something more creative? And a few beers later, uh, Chris Savage, the CEO of Wistia, and Adam uh, kind of got chatting and came up with the idea of we could do three different ads. One for $1,000, one for $10,000, one for $100,000 for the same product and see kind of how that played out, see which particular ads perform better, see what the creative process uh, changed when you were having these really restricted budgets. So we made these three ads. This was one made with an iPhone um, and $1,000 for the total budget for the ad. Um, and then we also did one uh, where we spent $10,000 on production. And this was with a Canon C300 camera sort of a more of a mid-range video. And then lastly, a proper high-end um, you know, commercial ad, $400,000 uh, using a, a proper cinema camera and Ari Amira. So we kind of explored doing these three different levels, super bootstrapped, kind of mid-range and high-end to look at the difference and how it worked. Um, and the results were actually like this. So the uh, $1,000 video kind of in terms of the, the metrics we were measuring, which was cost per install of our application, that was the main um, metric for success. We saw that the best performing video was actually the 10K, um, but you know, there wasn't a lot in it overall. Uh, cost per install was much better, but for the $100,000 and the $10,000, they were pretty equal. And the cost per engaged view, somebody watching at least 25% of the video was pretty similar for all of them, so, so fairly cheap. So uh, we then, off the back of this, thought, well, let's, you know, we've just created these ads and this was really helpful. Let's, why don't we document the process? So concurrently with building the ads, we also created a, um, a documentary, basically, about this whole process. And this kind of just happened organically, and we decided to then uh, publish this as a, a, a long-form, big creative piece that really explored the whole process of that um, yeah, kind of more creative and strategic um, process we've just gone through to make these three ads. So we made a long-form movie, basically. It's a 90-minute documentary, and we launched this on our website. It's called 1100, and we put it all up there. And we had a, a kind of goal for this particular campaign. We thought, you know what, this has been a big investment for us. The whole creative team have just basically gone and spent several months building a, uh, a long form piece of content. If we can get 100,000 engaged views, that would be a really good return. So we put this out and we were really hoping for something good. And uh, this is what we got. Uh, we got 100,000 engaged views. Uh, sorry, we were aiming for 100,000 gauge views, but we actually only got 31,000 gauge views, which was less than we were hoping for. So there was obvious kind of disappointment. But we then kind of thought, well, hold on. Actually, this campaign, by not maybe not by the standards that we uh, set, but it seems to have been a success. We ended up winning a Webby Award for it. We got lots and lots more customers um, coming and saying they loved it, and people, our you know, acquisition rate was up. And also, our brand search was up significantly. It was up about 11% just off the back of this one particular campaign. So we knew that actually something had really worked. It's just that the metrics we were using weren't indicating that success. When we dug into another metric, things started to look a bit different. So if we looked at actually the time spent, we saw that the time spent with this one piece of 90-minute uh, video, which was 8,500 hours, was equivalent to the amount of time that was spent watching the entirety of all of our blog content or reading the entirety of our blog content over that last year. So this was a huge difference in um, yeah, effort. All the blogs we'd ever made, you know, several, several thousand versus um, you know, 1,170. But the, uh, these four videos that lasted 90 minutes had actually delivered the same return. And this clicked that actually a 30-minute interaction with 3,000 people did more for a brand performance than a three-second interaction with 43 million people, thinking back to that campaign that we did in 2017. So when we start to measure the idea that actually the key thing was time watched, not number of touch points, so not number of impressions, but the amount of time spent, the whole mentality shifted and the creative mentality shifted. We started to think about, well, we're not going to care about the amount of people that we reach. We just care about the depth of that interaction. We, we care about the resonance that we're having with these people. So the, we then started to think there is a key metric that most of us are forgetting with all of our marketing, and it is the key metric for measuring and achieving success with brand, which is time spent. So if we then take different kinds of video content, for example, here we have uh, a product video. Uh, on the left, we have a social media video in the middle, and then we have our new category of brand marketing video on the right. We can see that they have different skills and different kind of strengths. The one on the left, Product video, not so many views, has really helped with assisted conversions. 
the one in the middle, the social media video, you know, maybe hasn't really helped with the conversion um, or time spent, but it has really helped us reach out to more people. It has got that engaged views. It has kind of got that reach. And then lastly, the brand marketing video. Well, it may not have necessarily that reach and it may not have helped with conversions, but it's really helped with engagement. It's really helped with people spending time with us. So instead of just what most of us are doing now and starting to create things that are just about touch points and the number of um, hits, reach, and conversions, start also to think about a third category of content, which is for brand marketing, which is about amount of time spent. So this was a revelation for us. And we realized this is what we should be doing. This is how we should be changing our marketing for brand. So we thought, well, what if we stop advertising on TV? What if we just stop investing all that money in TV and start instead investing in creating our own? And suddenly we saw that lots of other companies are doing this as well. Um, companies like Uber have started doing a thing called Uber Presents. Um, MailChimp is starting MailChimp Presents. And even a small company uh, down the road in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, called Price Intelligently, uh, ProfitWell, have started making their own little series um, and podcast about how to uh, you know, measure pricing pages and how to um, judge the success of them. So lots and lots of different kind of companies are across B2B and B2C were investing in, instead of advertising, building their own long-form content. And the value is obvious. Um, with short-form advertorial, we're focused on watching involuntarily. So we're shoving our content in front of people and hoping that they like it. Whereas um, with long-form entertainment, we are only really caring about people coming to watch us voluntarily. So we're really focused on that, um, people choosing to watch the content. With short-form advertorial, it's about quick to consume. Long-form entertainment, it's about people spending a significant amount of time and investing their energy in watching our content. The former, the short-form advertorial has to be simple and easy to understand, whereas long-form entertainment needs to be in-depth and detailed. And so what I would recommend and what I think we need to do in the modern world to really market our brand, no matter whether we are a small or a big business, is to create a show. And this process is called brand affinity marketing. So back to our two concepts, brand awareness, brand affinity. People know you, people like you. Um, we can go directly to brand affinity because brand awareness is not necessarily the value that it once was. In fact, we don't normally know about companies anymore through um, awareness, we know about them because they're recommended to us. So instead we have a, a concept called brand advocacy. If we think about the way in which we usually hear about products and services, yes, partially it's to do with generic recommendations. So if I search for something like best lobster roll in Boston, I'm gonna get some lists, but am I gonna trust this more than the alternative, which is going into a Slack group and asking a bunch of Boston natives what their particular preference is for lobster rolls? I'm obviously gonna trust the former. Um, I'm also going to trust the latter, sorry. And this is the situation we're in, where we now have instant access to recommendations from people who are experts in all the different kinds of things we have. So anytime we need purchasing information, we don't normally necessarily go to generic sources. We instead go to our channels of Slack, of WhatsApp, of places where we know that we have experts and individuals who can give us um, specific recommendations that we would trust. So we initially think about building advocacy. If we need to think about trying to improve brand advocacy, we think about doing it through influencer partnerships. Um, and this can kind of work to an extent, but you know, there's, a, there's a flaw with this because influencers are often just speaking directly to people. If we think about, um, you know, we have these different subsets. We, after our target customers, we have professions and interest groups that are, our customers are part of. Within that, even stronger communities and subcultures, influencers kind of sit off to the side and to try and work with influencers to directly then change the perception of the overall market can be quite challenging. Influencers are just kind of broadcasting and hoping to achieve shifts. But most of the perception, most of the actual uh, brand salience comes from the conversations between individuals within the market. And that's where things really start to change. So we could then think about yeah, investing in, well, let's really just try and speak to an entire profession or interest group and try and win them over to try and build the advocacy that will lead to affinity. Um, and again, that kind of can work, but you know, often these people are kind of scattered and not necessarily talking to one another. The real smart place to aim with this kind of creative content is communities and subcultures, because these are the groups of people who are really actively talking to each other all the time. So people who have an active, specific interest in a certain thing, whatever it might be, a certain passion, and they are part of a community or a group or an undercurrent who are always kind of conversing and trying to help each other out with the situation. Those are the worlds in which you can really build a brand because this is where the conversation happens. 
So affinity is driven by identity. So how do we as brand marketers kind of then speak to that? How do we kind of get involved? Well, I think we need to speak to the subcultures. We need to find our nerds. And I'll give you an example of this. So uh, I'm a musician. I'm a total kind of nerd for music. And I am a part of the uh, subreddit guitar pedals where uh, people who are big into guitar pedals just post pictures of their pedal boards and different pedals and talk about it all the time. Very, very active community. So how, you know, here is the subculture. How do we speak to them? Well, if we think about uh, two different companies here that are both um, trying to sell to the wider community of musicians, uh, one is a company guitar center, big kind of player in that market. And the other one is uh, my local uh, shop in London called Anderton's. And, you know, on the face of it, they look quite similar. Um, but Anderton's have really been able to stand out and achieve great success against some of the big players just by speaking directly to this community and subculture. So they have made a ton and ton of videos that are just basically musicians being really silly. So doing things like uh, trying to test which um, different kind of amplifiers and guitars they can tell with a blindfold on, um, you know, experimenting with stuff, just messing around, doing all the things that people wish they could do if they had more money and time. And this, of course, speaks like community and gets shared and people start to really care about it. So with this long form creative content you're going to start to create, think about creating content for communities who speak to one another, not just your target customer. You need to go one level broader, one level more niche and say, who are we really trying to speak to in terms of a community of people rather than a persona? And then we need to think about content distribution. So once we have decided we are going to start to create this content, we're going to create something different. How do we actually then distribute it? And I think we need to take a radically different approach because the way in which we distribute content right now is really just tied to that old model of eyeballs, of touch points. This touch point area that what we really need to do is get as many people to see all of our content all the time as possible. And any opportunity to uh, not distribute it further is a wasted opportunity. But I think this is flawed. Um, this is what happens when I try and, you know, when I'm exploring a YouTube channel. Okay, let's check out this brand that I like on YouTube. Uh, here's the latest video. Hey, I'm Chris from Wistia, and I'm shooting this video on a webcam. Cool. You can make an awesome video using nothing but your laptop's webcam. So let's run through some tips on how to do it. First off, be sure to oh, always keep the light. I remember this comedian. He was fine. great. Oh, I've got to see this. This sounds fun. Oh, there's loads of good comedy stuff. And, uh, so what I've done, I've, I use a, a What's this one here? There's other one he's done. Oh, he was on Conan. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yes, you're absolutely right. I'm actually from England. Uh, huh. So I had a bit of a tough time getting through immigration. What about these uh, What about these impersonations? Oh, an ad. Oh, for goodness sake. Okay. Wait for this to come. Yeah, next. Okay. What's this? You have to be really strict with yourself and go, I'm only doing Oh, what's this? Martial amps. You know, oh, I was looking at buying a martial amp. Oh, let's have a look at this. This seems cool. Okay, I'm going to like this video. What's it saying in the comments? Sounds good. So. Hmm. The first amp that we've got okay, and what have they got here? Something about pedal boards? Oh, I like pe pedal boards. Um, hey guys, it's the captain here. Oh, I need to buy a new pedal board. Let me have a quick look at that one there. That seems good. Okay. And uh, what's this? An ad for Nostalgic Music Center. It's the kind of thing I like. Um, oh, wow. Look at this record player. That seems great. Love it. I would love to get one of those. Um, Anyway, uh, how about uh, dogs uh, playing with dogs playing with cats? Great, <clears throat> that sounds cool. Let's see what we got here. Oh, perfect! Look at this one. Oh, <laughs> oh no! Wait, this is one I definitely want. Cats being jerks compilation. Huh? No. Sure, I have it. <laughs> No, please. No, come on. Oh, this is great. Come on. You don't even like. What was I meant to be doing again? 
You see, these platforms are not really built to optimize for time spent. They are built to serve as many ads as possible. So they are built with distractions built in them. So if we are optimizing for time spent, just thinking about putting our content everywhere across all these platforms and try and get people to see it, will not necessarily actually optimize for the thing we really care about, which is the amount of time that people are spending watching our content. Instead, it will just optimize for the amount of people watching it. But all of those interactions which are not meaningful, genuine investments are not going to help build your brand properly. So instead, I think what we need to do is start to think like a media company. And how do media companies work? Well, here is an example from The Good Place. So Good Place, obviously put up by NBC. Fantastic show, worth watching. Um, what they do is they will create a, uh, a new episode comes out, and what they'll do is they'll create a trailer for it. They'll then make this trailer. They'll put that across every different kind of uh, channel, uh, across you know, different kind of cuts and different formats for Instagram, for Snapchat, for uh, Twitter, for Facebook. Um, and then they'll kind of also distribute it on TV and in front of other shows in front of as ads. Then they'll have uh, interviews with the cast members. So they'll come out promoting the fact that there's a new episode out. Um, and this will be with you know, interviews on, on shows, on podcasts, on whatever. Um, this itself will then be distributed in all these different social platforms as well. We'll then go and do further interviews. And then that will be distributed in all these different platforms. Uh, and then finally, the episode launches. And then the episode comes out. And it airs in a very restricted private space where people have to actively seek out and go to rather than being distributed in all different platforms. But we've built up the demand in advance. Then what happens? Well, then you can kind of rewatch it on the website. And then there's highlights from this particular show that then will go out and be spread across on social media. And then we're going to create more of those. And then there'll be a particular podcast and there'll be interviews on other podcasts by the cast members. Uh, and that will then be distributed in all these platforms. And soon, as you can see, by every single episode, there are many, many multiple different assets, all centered around promoting this core central asset of the particular content itself. And this is how media companies work. They don't think about content distribution. They think about audience development and audience acquisition. And the focus has to be, instead of just thinking about getting our content out there, it's about bringing people to us so that we can control the experience so that we can ensure that they're watching as much as they can, so that we are you know, using all this content that we're creating to create more content which goes on social media, but using social media as a tool to build an audience and thereby build a brand. In other words, thinking of it like Netflix. So with Netflix, what do they do? They go on, uh, if, you know, do, do Netflix publish everything on social media? No, look at their YouTube channel, and it's just trailers, it's clips, it's trailers, clips and trailers, snippets tasters trying to get people uh, through their experience of social media to watch short form content in, an, uh, in the manner that's going to make sense on that particular platform where attention spans are short and they're only spending a few seconds, watching quick snippets that drive them to a longer experience that they are then going to have that uh, time and long engagement with content that's going to really help build that brand affinity. So use social media to advertise your content not your business. And this, I think, is the revolutionary aspect of this method of brand building. Instead of just trying to get us out there, we are trying to bring people to us. So market exactly like a media company. And at Wistia, this is our attempt to do just that. Uh, we, after the success of 1700, created a new series that came out uh, last summer called Brand Wagon um, that was an interview show. And this was our way of marketing that like a media company on social media. Comes a brand new show with a brand new strategy in a brand new studio. Introducing Brandwagon. It's like a talk show, but for marketers. Hosted by Wistia's own CEO. And some of you are probably seeing this thinking, Phil, this is crazy. Are you really saying that in order to build a brand, we need to become Netflix? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying, precisely. Not in the sense that you need to start building the amazing kind of content that Netflix are doing, not necessarily that high level, but you need to start thinking about creating uh, content that speaks to a specific niche audience such that for them, because you have so well targeted their, con their particular interests, it is as interesting and as vital for them to consume your content as it would be for them to watch Netflix. And think about the fact that you are a niche publisher. And to build a brand, you need to become a niche publisher, creating really different and interesting content for a very specific community that the wider media landscape are not going to invest in. But you as a business can. And if you become the Netflix of plumbing, if you become the Netflix of uh, sales management, whatever it might be, 
through doing that, you can become the brand that will stand out, that will build that reputation that lasts a long time. So think about audience distribution rather than, con sorry, think about audience development rather than content distribution. You're trying to build that audience, build super fans, measure people when they get to your website in terms of the depth of their engagement, their connection. It doesn't matter how many there are, it matters how deep their connection is with you. Because having 3,000 people who really, really care about your business will deliver much more value in terms of word of mouth and brand salience and essentially preference at the end of the day than just getting a few hundred million impressions with um, you know, a short ad that goes out on all these different platforms. Care about depth of interaction rather than the amount of interactions themselves. So then you need to start thinking about how you can do that. Well, one of the key things is to then build that on your website. And Wistia, after their success um, building this kind of strategy, has actually pivoted the entire product to help serve it as well. So you can build up your Netflix on your website, your own kind of channel that's not full of ads, that has this unique branded experience. And you can use, therefore, this particular place, this website asset that you have, to then capture emails as well. Because an email is worth far more than a Facebook like or YouTube subscriber. So again, instead of thinking about social media as the place for this content, think about building your own ecosystem, bring people into the CRM, bring them through and start to communicate with them on a regular basis. If you own the distribution channel, you own the audience data, then you don't have to worry about all that stuff we talked about to start with, with uh, GDPR and connections and spending money with YouTube and Facebook every time that you need to try and promote your content. If you own the audience data, you can then advertise more effectively as well. So you can start to use the advertising channels themselves to do more effective direct response advertising and more effective um, advertising of your content rather than just spending money fruitlessly on lots and lots of brand ads. So instead of just spending money on advertising, your new strategy is as follows. You are going to be trying to aim directly to build brand affinity. Your metric for success here is going to be the time that people are spending with your brand. The creative that you're going to invest in is long form entertainment. Ideally, this is going to be video content, but if you really can't start with a video, a podcast is a great way to go as initially as well. Something that people are going to really spend time with consuming. You're going to target subcultures and communities, specific niche audiences who are passionate, who have a particular interest that they converse with each other about, and you're going to create the best content in the world for that group of people, no matter how small, no matter how niche it is. And then with distribution, you're going to market like a media company. You're going to drive individuals to your platform. You're going to think about audience development rather than just trying to push your content out to them in all the pitches. Sounds complicated, but I promise uh, just making a small start on this, you will start to see the returns very quickly. And if you need a hand getting started, I'm very happy to offer further suggestions and advice on maybe the audience you need to target or the kind of idea that you could go with for uh, a long form entertainment series of your own. So please feel free to drop me an email and I'm happy to help. And uh, thank you ever so much for your time and take care.